welcome to the Art of World of Warcraft panel. Your panelists are Eric Browning, Gary Plattner, Chris Robinson, and Wendy Vetter. What's up, BlizzCon? I can already see the look in your eyes. No, I am not Chris Metzen. Thank you. For the record, I grew my beard first, and Chris Metzen looks like me. I also didn't forget my lines. I brought them with me. No, my name is Chad Wingard. I am a member of the World of Warcraft community team. Some of you know me as Crypto. A name many of you are familiar with, having seen my NPC run around Stormwind aimlessly looking for cheese and kittens. Uh, no, we will not be taking any requests to nerf my damage. Uh, have no fear, though. I'm not here to cause you to corpse run back into the hall. I'm here to represent you as we go over the art of World of Warcraft. Today, we have a lineup of incredible talent that have brought you some of the most eye-popping, incredible details that you will be able to see in the next expansion. Uh, what you are about to see here, you cannot see anywhere else. Uh, it will blow your mind, and uh, all of it will be available on Warlords of Draenor. If you're so inclined, by the way, you can see some of the latest developments over at the World of Warcraft demo area, which is in Hall B. Uh, we have gone to great lengths to gather up your questions about animation, dungeon, environment, and prop design. As an added bonus, though, we're going to address one of the hottest, most popular questions we've gotten for a very long time. Where are the new character models? So let's get this started. Please welcome to the stage Senior Art Director Chris Robinson, Lead Animator Steve Aguilar, Lead Environment Artist Gary Plattner, Lead Dungeon Artist Wendy Vetter, and Lead Prop Artist Eric Browning. The first question that we have coming up is going to be for you, Chris. It comes from Lixia from Korgoth. The biggest thing that she wants to see from the art panel is a glimpse at new player models and animations. Okay. So, you guys can't see that. Are they going to put this on? There we go. So, wow, look at all you guys. I'm going to pretend I can see everybody because I can't see anything right now, but it looks like there are a lot of people here, which is cool. This is really cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I want to get started with this. We have a lot of really cool stuff to show you guys. First and foremost, is thank you for coming out. It's really awesome that everybody's into WoW art, and you know we're humbled that you're all here and want to see the cool stuff we were working on. So to get started on it, um, I did want to give you guys a quick look at what we're doing with these guys. If you can see that, everybody come around and look at this monitor right here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this, I'm going I'm to give you a little breakdown on the process that we went through. Uh, we're working on the new player character models. These guys, and maybe a little bit about her as well. <laughs> All right, so to get started, um, I want to talk a little bit about core philosophies that we use when we were redesigning the characters. I want to stress this is not really, and I just use the word redesign, but I'm going to take that back because it really is just kind of like a like a, uh, a refresh of the characters. We didn't sit down and really want to go like. Let's change everything and make sure that nobody knows what they're looking at anymore. We wanted to make sure that what you guys felt like were the iconic features of your characters we maintained and we just made it look a lot better. We needed to refine things where necessary. So one of the coolest parts of this whole process is us sitting down in a room and just kind of looking at our current player models and trying to figure out like what we're looking at. So, so to be honest, a lot of the current stuff in game, like our, like our dwarf male here, it's sort of hard to tell. Like, What's going on with his hairstyle? Some of the facial features are just really hard to read. I'm sure this isn't new information to you, but it was one of the things that really took us a long time to go, like, if we change this, are people going to be bummed or are they going to be stoked and hopefully make the decision that is going to make you guys stoked in the end? 
And then ultimately, um, unify the rendering. So it's really important to us as a team that when you log on and you see your player standing next to another player in Ogremar or Stormwind or wherever, that you feel like there was one person who modeled, textured, and animated that character. Um, so we went to great lengths to just make sure that everything looked consistent all the way through. Whether it was you know, a team of four character artists that were working on, on these guys at any one time, and they went back and forth with everybody. This wasn't just one person working in a room. This was you know, uh, all the characters, it was myself, everybody just kind of pitching in to make sure that they look killer and awesome. And a whole team of animation um, just to make a move and do really cool stuff. So um, next question. All right, next question comes from ACL of Proudmore. And uh, this person has a two part question. Of course, the first one is gonna be for you, Chris. Could you share with us some more detail about the actual process of revamping characters? And did you run into any specific hurdles while you were creating them? Yeah, so several thousand hurdles, um, and all good. Uh, and yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. So I mentioned previously these meetings that we'd have about like, what are we looking at? And I think this is a prime example of that. Um, it's obviously the Scourge male. And you know, we all know, obviously, like that's his spine sticking out of his back, and he's got bone protrusions on his shoulder. But really, when you look at it, the spine's just kind of this weird like slug type shape, and the <laughs> shoulders are kind of kind of weird, and he's got some facial features that you can't really tell her what are going on. So. Here's what we did with the, with the Scourge Mail, and here's the updated model. Nice. That's, that's the reaction I was looking for. I'm like, there's a whole collective sigh of relief coming from the character team and myself right now. Oh, I'm just going to sleep for a little while on the stage, and somebody wake me up. Um, no, okay, so, yeah, anyhow, you'll notice, like, on the spine, uh, we really wanted to define what you were looking at. We wanted to make sure that this stuff matched some of the things that, you know, when we put a new boss uh, model in the game, we get a lot of feedback from the community that says, like, that looks amazing. Why can't I look like, why can't I look like Gar Garrosh or any of these characters? And so that's what we did. We wanted to make sure that all of these guys were at that level, if not better than what you've seen from us previously. Here are some facial variations for the... Okay, so yeah, let's, uh, that question, and I wanted to, I definitely wanted to talk a little bit about our process. So this is a breakdown of sort of our process and to give you guys an idea of like how we went about doing this. Um, you see on the top right, that's obviously the current in-game uh, gnome male. And to his left is his uh, wireframe and, and uh, gray model. There's a lot of technical information here, but really the thing to pay attention to is sort of the, the above and below. And that'll give you an idea of like when we were doing the revamp, how much detail we actually put into these new models. Um, to talk a little bit about the process, what we'll do is we'll sit down and, like I said, we'll look at the old existing model or the current existing model, and we'll talk about what things we want to maintain and what things we want to exaggerate, and then we'll do a concept like the one you see here to really pick out some of the facial features and other things that we think are important. And then we go into modeling and texturing, which is what you see on the bottom. The bottom right is the uh, actual, like the basic uh, modeled and textured no male without any of his facial hair or any, any of the options turned on. Obviously, his hair is turned on. Um, quick breakdown on numbers, so without getting into too much detail, I'm assuming everyone here can, can read for the most part. I have a difficulty with that, but I'll read it to you just in case. Uh, so 956 polygons versus 5,408. That's a pretty average difference um, that we're seeing when we're doing these revamps. But the bone count here specifically, uh, the gnomes are very small, and so they don't require as much uh, intricate movement as some of, the, some of the other characters. So you'll actually see some of the larger characters have upwards of like 250 bones for the newer models that we're doing. Um, texture sizes are obviously much larger, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. But all of, that, all of this stuff, all the polygons and all the bones and all this technical information, what it really means is that we're now able to go from what used to be the kind of Muppet style, you know, like characters that could just open their mouths and blink every now and then, to characters who can do things like this. So um, obviously this has a lot of game implications we're really excited about, whether it's a quest giver that's really adamant about you going and doing something for them, or scared of someone coming to slaughter them. But you know, there's a lot of other implications that are really cool, like what's the, you know, what's the community going to do with this when they start making uh, you know, in-game films, machinima, and things like that. We're just super stoked to see what people do with, the, with this new, new technology and how they use it. So um, breakdown of the texture size stuff. What you see here is obviously the in-game uh, uh, dwarf male. So his body texture size, that's, that's what you're seeing in-game right now. His, uh, his entire body and head is a 512 by 512, and his head texture actually shares that bottom right-hand corner. 
and it's mirrored. So everything you see on the face currently has to be symmetrical. That hair texture is actually the hair that we use for every single hair that you see in the game has to come off of that one texture. His hand's kind of covering it here, but on the right-hand side, you'd see the braid that, you, that he has on his beard. But we really have to figure out a way to make that work for everything. Our new dwarf male is this guy. So you'll see, like, I actually broke this out um, into two sections here, which drives our lead technical artist crazy. But re in reality, what it is and what you're seeing is the face texture and the body texture are on one huge sheet. And we broke the face texture apart like that so that we could specifically do non-symmetrical facial features. So we can do scars. And the things that you saw with the Pandaren model, that's kind of what we're trying to pull off now. The Pandaren model was really what we set out as kind of like a goal. When we did that, it was a test to see how far we could push our engine before we broke it. Um, so after the programmers came and screamed at us a few times, we, we came to an agreement and um, sort of set that as the bar, and that's what we've been trying to match ever since. The hair texture is obviously twice the size now, and it's what you see there that we are creating all the new hairs with. Here's a beauty shot of the dwarf male along with one of the facial poses we're able to do. All right, let's talk dwarf female. Uh, we're just in process with her, but we wanted to give you guys as much as we possibly could. So these are just some renders of what we call her T-pose. This is how it comes out of modeling before it goes into animation. And there's, there's a close-up on her face. Here's what we've done with the orc male. You've seen a little bit of this already, but here's a little bit of a closer shot. Um, and Steve is actually going to show some really cool animation stuff so you can see this guy moving around a little bit more and more expression. I wanted to fa focus on the face a little bit. This is our current in-game uh, gnome female, obviously. She's trying to smile here. I don't know if you can tell. Uh, I, I couldn't. I didn't really didn't know what was going on. But somebody told me she's smiling. So when we created the new one, we used that expression, and this is what we came up with. Again, before and after. And here's a beauty shot of her with some of her expressions. And lastly, uh, this guy. Oh, so there's no interest in, OK, I'll just go back to uh, Here's where we're at. We just, just got this guy done. He's hot off the presses. But here's where we're at with the Torin now. Thank you guys so much. Steve's going to talk a little bit about animation. All right. The second half of ACL's question is going to be a great one for Steve. Essentially, what's being asked on the next slide, which is missing. OK, here's the question. Were there hurdles that you encountered uh, that related more towards any underlying principles with design, or were they technical in nature? Also, what aspects of new character models turned out to be the easiest to address? So one of the technical challenges that we faced was uh, the facial hair. We, we weren't sure if we were going to have enough bones to animate the individual pieces of the hair. So a technical artist came up with this solution for us at the time. So the checkered geometry that you're seeing represents the beard, the mustache, and the sideburns. So it's going to follow the character's body movements and this helps for the hair to retain its shape and volume. This will also help to prevent it from displaying any odd behavior. We should have used this for the new player character redo. Oh, that'd be perfect. What? Oh, we could do that. <laughs> In the end, we were able to get enough bones to animate the, the facial hair. One of the biggest challenges for us is preserving the existing animations. These help to establish the look and feel for the characters that you've grown to love. So here you see the current model. And here's your updated dwarf. You can see he's got a lot more detail, a lot more character to his face. And he's just been brought up to the same level of quality as our panda models. Here's an example of uh, preserving his animation. You can see we're still trying to keep that same feel and look of the dwarf but we just added a little more weight and loosened up his body. You can see his facial hair is moving. The current model wasn't really handling dynamic poses all that well. So you can see the updated model with the additional geometry is able to, to handle that. Some animations were 
just not coming across very well, so the animators wanted to punch up their personality. Some animations just just by adding expression and animating the hair just really helped to make it pop out a lot more. And if you choose to customize without a mustache, you can see all the hard work the animators put into the face. So same process with the, with the orc. His hair was stuck to his body. His face was looking a little plain, and he just needed to be up, updated. You can see his hair is detached from the body. He just looks a lot more aggressive and feels a lot more muscular. We got rid of a lot of the pops and hitches that were that were present in his animations. With the walk, we really wanted to increase his weight a little bit more, just make him feel heavier. You can see we've loosened up his body a lot more. His, all the, the characters' capes now have a chain of bones, so they'll flow more naturally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And same with his, his emotes, he went through the same, same touch-up process, just trying to still preserve that, the existing animation, just punching it up a lot more. Animations that didn't have a, a whole lot of movement now have more fluid motion. And here's a quick glimpse of the gnomes. By this point, the team is come onto the gnomes, they're, they're uh, comfortable with the facial rig, they've applied the same touch-ups with the adding animation to the hair, and he's just consistent with the orc and dwar uh, dwarf. His facial features are a lot larger, so you can really make out those expressions. And something is, just by adding a facial expression to the dance just helped make it pop out a lot more. It makes it pop out a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Poor choice of words. <laughs> the animators had a lot of fun with, with the gnome female. You can see her hair also has movement now. She's got a lot more character to her face. You can really see the emotion coming out of the animations now. You look closely, her cheeks are moving. You can see all these different shapes that have, that are, uh, that have been posed in her emotes. And her dance looks more like, a, like she's twerking now, so it's good. It's nice. <laughs> give it up, give it up. Actually really excited to see what they can do with the machinima now. <laughs> Next up is a really long question, and this one's going to be for you, Gary. As we can see on the screen, Mahanar from Ice Crown has basically asked, Man when, Man Man when a new zone is about to be created, where does it all begin? Are you taking cues from overhead maps, concept art, or are there other values that need to be considered before a zone can be developed? Well, that's a really good question, Chad, and I'm uh, really glad we got an environment question. But I just want to take a second and thank you, Chad, for coming and uh, being our uh, mentor for us. We, we asked Chad last minute, uh, and he's from the community team, and I thought he'd be great, and you're doing great. So thank you very much, Chad. Uh, thank you. I'm so nervous. Awesome. All right, so let's get going. So that's, that's pretty hard to uh, follow up uh, uh, the, the uh, character team. So as you know, the environment team is responsible for all of the exterior environments of the world. And it's really exciting to talk about what it takes to make an entire zone just from scratch. 
it's pretty fast and easy, actually. It's just that fast. So most people don't realize that the uh, environment team actually gets a lot of creative freedom, uh, uh, a lot of creativity that, uh, that we get to put into the game. And uh, when it comes to starting uh, a new environment or an especially a new expansion, it's really exciting time for us because literally anything goes and the possibilities are endless. So sometimes it's a little difficult to get started and figure out where to start in a zone. So to answer the question with the uh, zone maps right here or the concept art, concept art, we actually use a little bit of both. Our concept art, or our zone maps rather, they'll tell us like how big a zone is, how big the playable spaces are, and basically what's happening in the zone. But our environment map, or our concept art rather, that's going to tell us the real meat of the zone, the real real artistic vision of the zone, the mood, the lighting, the color of the zone. And it's also important to remember that our concept art is made by artists and our zone maps, well, they're made by designers. So we have to f do every, do, use both of them actually to fulfill that vision. So luckily we do have help from our extra level team. These guys take all of our props and all of our textures and trees and everything and help us uh, put it together in the zone with a uh, wow edit that you see here. So they're really help, all helping us to fulfill that vision from the concept art. We do have a lot of tech help from our tech team. And uh, I got a really cool demo for some texture scaling that we can do. This debuted in Missa Pandaria and we're still trying to figure out how to use it best. But isn't that cool? We took a regular size texture and can scale it up and it still tiles just like a regular texture does. So we can paint another texture right on top and really get a lot of dynamic range out of one texture. Another really cool thing is height-based texturing. So you see I can paint snow right onto the cracks of another texture. So we're basically taking a tile set and putting another texture in there that can tell us the height and, and you know the dark parts there can tell you where the, uh, where the low bits of the texture are. It's really cool process. This also kind of debuted in Mesa Pandaria, but it basically allows the uh, texture artist to paint like a rock texture right onto the snow, and depending on the pressure you're putting, how much that texture is gonna come through. So you can see you, put, you push harder more of that texture. I could even take a, uh, some lava and paint right in between the cracks of another texture. This was literally impossible just a few years ago. Another really cool feature what you're seeing here is vertex shading. What that is, just lets us like paint light and color right onto the texture, beyond what the texture can do. It really adds a whole other dynamic range to our environments. You're going to see here these textures without any vertex shading on. They look really good, but in a second you're going to see it with vertex shading. There you go. Adds a whole other dynamic range to our textures. You won't even notice some of that's even happening. Thanks. Very nice. That was Matt Sanders right there. He's working on his own. He might be. Another really cool feature I like, which usually comes about the end of uh, creating a zone, is our lighting. So here you see the regular lighting for Frostfire, and there's completely different lighting. That's not just the skybox changing, that's the direct light, the fog, the ambient light is all changing. And look at how much it changes the mood. We can make it feel hot, we can make it feel scary. It adds a whole nother element to just fulfilling that, uh, that vision from the concept, from the concept piece that we got. So that's a really a really fast rundown of all of the, uh, the tech and the, and the work that we go into uh, making all of our zones. Here's a shot of, uh, what is this, Terracar. Nice callback to, uh, or I'm sorry, that's Talador. Looks like Terracar, callback to Terracar. So really a lot goes into um, making our zones and fulfilling that vision. Uh, I should mention too that some of the stuff you're seeing may change because we're actively working on this stuff right now. I literally captured most of this footage about, about two weeks ago. Uh, so we're still working on this stuff. We do do a lot of iteration. We'll build an entire zone and if it just doesn't feel like, feel right, even if it follows our concept, we're gonna do it again. We'll, do, we'll just, uh, it's called iteration and, and we'll redo it. This is Gorgon right here. So a lot of this stuff is, uh, is still in, uh, in the works. So hopefully by the time you play it, uh, you may notice a few changes, may notice a few upgrades. This is uh, Shadow Moon. Really proud of a lot of these zones. So a lot of effort went into it. A lot of people behind this. So when you see one, one picture like this, it's over a dozen people, a dozen artists that have, uh, that have touched this one scene. 
So really, so that's uh, just to answer the question, whether we start with concept art, whether we start with um, zone maps, uh, we really start with the, as many things as we can and the zone maps and uh, concept art really help us fulfill that vision. So really good question. Thanks, Chad. Keep your eye on the frog. There it goes. All right, the next one is for Wendy Tarhoof from Earth and Ring has a couple of questions. The first essentially asks, when it comes to dungeon design, how are different responsibilities in your department handled? Do individuals help out in all aspects or do they tend to focus on one discipline? Uh, well, as far as the dungeon team's concerned, um, they are very multidisciplined, multi-talented. Some of that stuff I might not be able to mention on this panel, maybe another one. Um, uh, but because of the scope of assets that we create for the game, we divide the team up into two separate skill sets. We have texture artists and we also have 3D modelers. We then team them up to create uh, some of the buildings and structures. For instance, uh, this cool asset. Um, it is the home of the Thunderlord clan. Uh, I'm sure the designers have come up with some really jazzy, spiffy name for it, something I probably won't be able to pronounce, but we just call it simply Bone Town because it's got bones in it. So our 3D artist, well, what do they do? 3D art, obviously, modeling. Um, they will also work on uh, the block out, uh, trying to work with the designers to come up with the, the layout. They'll also start artifying that block out. They'll come up with a general lighting scheme, and this will change throughout the process, when, especially when we get uh, textures onto it. They work with the designers about play space, add some UV texture mapping, um, prop placement, and that uh, little bug generating uh, invisible, barrier, invisible barrier called collision that players seem to figure out how to exploit. You know who you are. So uh, while the dungeon uh, artist is working on uh, dungeons, they become the sort of the gatekeeper or dungeon master, so to speak. Um, they will work with design, obviously, and uh, the prop team. Sometimes they'll work with the environment team because we'll have uh, exterior dungeons. They'll work with uh, programmers if there's something specific that the design uh, requires as far as the play space and um, the boss encounter. Uh, I'm showing here the uh, ogre compound, and you can see how all of those elements are coming together really nicely. Basically, for uh, dungeon artists, their uh, kind of duty is to develop the flow and the functionality, or what maybe the new and shiny Metsum might call uh, the vibe. The vibe. <laughs> Missed that cue there. So our texture artists, uh, they kind of work a little more organically within the team, um, working on dungeons as well as cultures. Uh, some of their responsibilities include, but not limited to, uh, coming up with concepts. They'll uh, figure out what material choices. They'll do paint overs on the models, base textures, uh, unique textures, and they will also do UV mapping, their favorite. Or maybe not. So um, our process for um, creating textures really hasn't changed, um, maybe post Missa Pandaria. We're just getting better at it. We still do um, hand-painted textures. We don't use any photo manipulation. But we have included ZBrush as part of our process. And this is kind of added to the look, um, enhanced basically what is already a, a wow style. Basically, when you give uh, a an artist, a new crayon in their crayon box, they're going to go crazy with it. So you'll see more of that in 6.0. And back to you, Chad. All right. The second question from Tarhoof asks, as you can see, what goes into designing a cultural package for a new race? Well, first and probably most importantly, we need to get their story. It's what helps us artists kind of brainstorm and come up with some really good ideas. Um, there we go. The story. read the little part there. So uh, with the Iron Horde, for example, we already knew we had some design hits that uh, we were kind of vibing on. 
um, from the Garage compound raid. There was one in particular uh, design hit that we really were liking. It's grill. Okay, not that grill. This grill. You may recognize it. Um, and we were really liking this uh, design, and so we wanted to make sure we carried it out um, through 6.0, and this is kind of what we came up with. So it'll be kind of fun if you're walking through the uh, ironwork kit, you'll, you'll kind of notice this. So once we get the general pitch, we start uh, collecting reference, and uh, we kind of look to history, different cultures, and figuring out how uh, we can pillage some of that and put it into our new culture kit style some of the things that we start referencing. As we're working on that, we start uh, coming up with concepts, little rough sketches. Um, sometimes we'll draw on post-its, whatever works just to try to get the idea going. Um, the goal for us is to try and uh, bring everything together for not just as artists, but for the designers and pretty much everybody else that's involved in the process. And uh, once we do that, we come up with kind of a, a taste piece. And uh, this piece, uh, I'm surprised to find it, uh, it it's pretty much um, gets burned and forgotten. And we move on to uh, creating uh, a block out of that piece. And then we'll start playing around with materials and different silhouettes, a little bit of tweaking here, um, adding spikes there. And then finally, Against all odds, we will come up with a design. And everybody is happy with it except for that one guy. And we pretend to ignore him and we move on to the style guide. So the, the uh, style guide for us is just a bunch of call outs, um, kind of helping us know what we want to um, put across the whole entire kit. Some of the things that we're thinking about when uh, we're creating that, um, scale and proportions, silhouette, obviously very important, lighting, color, that's huge on our team, uh, and exaggeration, as well as composition once it gets put in the environment. What is it going to look like? So sometimes, as we are coming up with concepts, uh, shapes start to kind of look like other shapes. And um, this is no offense to the artist. Jimmy Lowe is an amazing artist. But for me, I just started looking at it. And I'm like, is there something familiar about this? I don't know. Maybe you guys can see it. I don't know. There might be some robots <laughs> from a cartoon. From the future? From the future, maybe. All right. I'm seeing it. There, there it is. is. Ta-da. It's good. People saw it. All right, our next question for Wendy is uh, from Kai Sear of Lightning's Blade. She would like to know, how do you think the WoW art style will evolve in the next expansion and beyond? Um, I would say we're constantly evolving, but our um, fundamentals will always stay the same. Um, for instance, we're working on the garrisons, and you're probably familiar with these assets. They're from the human and orc uh, from Vanilla, Vanilla WoW. Um, but what we tried to do is enhance the style and enhance the character of them. Uh, once we get the props on this, it'll, it'll really kind of start to sing and, and come together nicely. So, you know, pretty much with the dungeon team, we don't fail to give you eye candy. So look forward to that in 6.0. All right, so far we've gone through character, animation, environment, and dungeon design. And now let's take a moment to center ourselves. Let's find our zen and contemplate the wise and philosophical question from this young player of Kieran Tor. <laughs> what is best in life, Eric? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Life best is what? That's pretty subjective. I didn't really have time to prepare for this or think of an answer. But if I had to guess, I think we can all agree that what is best in life is tanks. <laughs> tanks are the best.
Tanks are the best because you can put a tank with anything and that thing will be better. If you think of a movie with Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg, if you add a tank to it, suddenly it's awesome. If you have a tank and add another tank to it, it's a doubly awesome tank. If your kid is having a birthday party, it's better with a tank. So with that very well thought out philosophy, the moment that we heard we were going to do this thing called the Iron Horde, we went right for, well, can we do like a machine army? And uh, the answer is yes, we can, but we have to really be careful that we don't turn these guys into another race of goblin engineers. So we also made a style guide, and this is basically a set of rules. I'm not going to make you read all the crap on there, but you can see the ball in the corner with the pointy things on it is the Corcoran Looks like pointy thing ball from Siege of... Let's be honest here. None of us know the names of any of this stuff until we hear it on a forum or something. It's, it's called the spiky ball. And uh, <laughs> spiky ball... No, now I'm really flustered. <laughs> so the, the idea behind that was to put something in the Siege of Ogremar that we could call out to in the expansion to give a little bit of a connection, like where did the orcs suddenly get tanks? Well, they have this engine, and Garrosh is a genius, and I think we all know that. He's, a, a, he's not a genius, but he remembers or brings with him, tucks into his loincloth, plans for this thing, and smuggles look at this is we're not going to admit to this afterwards but this is the one connecting thread to that siege and uh, you'll see that same thing carried on throughout all of their weapons the main reason is so that they look uh, consistent or that they don't look too complicated look at that flamethrower tank it's a tank that's a flamethrower we call it the fire engine because it's an engine with fire and it blows up <laughs> heavy cannon Blows up also. The tickler. <laughs> Heavy mortar. Oh, it punches. It's a tank and it punches. Because it's not enough to shoot somebody. You can punch them. And they can punch back. A chariot. I just saw this in the game the other day, and it's really cool having, because it's not super huge, it's just big enough for you to deal with and get run over by pretty easily, but uh, super awesome. Anyway. All right, next up is Catherine from Airy Peak would like to know, how do you decide how far to take a given faction or racial aesthetic? For example, in Miss Pendaria, the Grummel have their own architecture but lack a unique Racial mailbox to go with it. The Claxi, however, do have a mailbox. How do you decide? Oh, look, apparently they do have a mailbox. Come on. It's a guy. There's all kinds of lore written about these guys that says they were messengers to the Mogu and then the Pandarans, and it's a really, really wordy way of saying, let's make the NPC be the mailbox. I totally uh, knew that was there. I wrote about the Timeless Isle. Uh, so then how do you prioritize this stuff? Mailboxes? Well, <laughs> or spiky things. So whether or not somebody gets them, so like the Iron Horde, that's these guys here, they probably won't get a mailbox because players aren't going to hang out for long around their stuff. They're going to go in and they're going to fight and, and uh, fight a lot and get run over a lot. So they don't need a mailbox. But if a race is connected with a hub and players can spend the night there alive, they'll get a mailbox. Uh, we base this, uh, how much work we put into these by how much we think we're going to um, put players there, put players with them. We're often wrong, of course. I mean, we're never, ever wrong. <laughs> Ogres, I'm going through a few kits and I'm going to show you something really sad. Uh, so. This is all fun, but then I'm going to show you a sad slide. So just, you know, 
be ready. Ogres, there's meat, because they're ogres, and we've got the Drenai, and this was actually a lot of fun because we didn't really get to finish, I feel, with the Drenai the first time around. Now we get to go in and sort of describe their life, put less of the floaty crystals, more of, you know, these guys are another race in Warcraft. They fight just like everybody else, and they, they uh, have a day-to-day -day life. We're showing a lot of that in this, and that kit is much more fleshed out. Also, it helps to have, when you have a big bad wolf, you need a little piggy. And that's these guys. That's my opinion, anyway. Oh, you guys all like the Drenai, don't you? I like the Drenai. They have powers. Uh, <laughs> orcs. The orc clans are cool. This is mostly basic orc stuff, and then we're going to do more things for the specific clans. I think the sad one is next, so children, look away. This is the kobold kit. <laughs> do you know how many of these creatures have died? I found out that between us, just in the Alliance starting zone, just there, Northshire Abbey, going down to Elwyn, over a billion with a B. That is, that is genocide. It's huge. Oh, but we want the candles on their heads. Fuck you, we'll take your candle. What? All right, I'm going to give this name the precise French pronunciation. Hippo <clears throat> from Shadow Song wants to know how much time goes into set dressing and are the designs of interior spaces driven by the owners of the establishment and their culture or the zone they're in or a combination of both? Uh, what? Hippo. So a lot of time, a lot of time. A lot of time, as much as the producers will give us. We will spend every last second, and producers have fake time, and the time, the time they tell us that something's due, and the real secret date that they keep behind their desk. And we know that there's a secret date, so we always push for more stuff. So every chance we get, we try to put everything, it kills us if we end up with something like Kazan where there was empty goblin houses. It, it's, it's, it murders us. But this question is very long. Designs the interior space driven by the owners. Yeah, it's driven by the owners. Who else would it be driven by? And the zone. And a combination of both. So, oh good, I have a slide that describes this. The garrisons are super cool because we get to redo a whole lot of the stuff that we already did, like the Alliance Human. If you look at this, it manages to look like the original kit, but it's actually a whole lot more detailed. There's a lot more stuff in here. And uh, there's that backpack, which nobody in the world wears. But it's there. And you can recognize little swords and whatnot. We have, uh, here it is in the garrison. All those pieces get moved around, and each little bed has its own story. Kind of. And uh, we have a knife stuck into a nice table. We have the same backpack. But again, a big kit of stuff, so we can keep, the designers can keep placing stuff. Oh, there's a candle. See the candle? At what cost? <laughs> and the trade skills. I don't know about you guys, but the trade skills to me have always bugged me because there's never enough going on there. This, you walk up on this and there's going to be a guy working here. When it rains, I'm going to commit to this. When it rains, he's going to go sit inside and drink or smoke. He's got his own keg there and he's going to hang out and stay out of the rain. And uh, we're hoping to get a little more of that kind of action with the NPCs so that they, at least in the trade skills, so that they can uh, just feel a little more real, like they have a life, other than waiting for you to poke them. <laughs> there it is in the garrison. Oh, so pretty. And you know, actually the slide that Wendy showed earlier, or the movie, was much better than what I'm showing because it showed more of the props, but this is the Ogre Citadel, the corner, where there's no props. And so we make, we have to fill this out, and of course you're fighting a lot of ogres in here, and so we always have to keep the floors open, but our job is to figure out, well, how do you make the periphery look full enough so it feels like a, uh, a lively place? This is a... Uh, 
This one is better than her movie because we have a better throne here than the one that was there. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, anyway, so we make stuff like that, and that's my last slide. All right, and of course, the most important question about not taking candles, how many candles can you not take in game? I mean, how many different models are there in game? This question is even sadder now because out of all those billions, there's only 572 candles, and I counted them, and I, I got a look from Chris. It's a look that we never like getting, but I got the look and the little... I just know when I said I spent an hour. So you what? I just know how long it takes you to count, so I figure we're probably... <laughs> My kids already know, but I get to 10, and then I get really flustered. So 572, including 42 of those are for the 42 different kobolds uh, that are in the game as well. All right, there we go. Thank Kobold. you, Hippo, for making me count all those. <laughs> Hippo. I'm sorry if you get any harassing tells in game. All right, finally, one more question. This one's going to be for Steve. Haley from Wormrest Accord wants to know... Actually, she says, I'd actually like to know your process for when you do an animation for a spell. Okay. What I have here is... Oh, that works. Is it that amazing? Oh, man. Come on. There, there we is. go. So this was an animation uh, for a character that required uh, a spell effect to be applied to it. So to the right of the screen, uh, the animator blocks in, just with simple geometry, um, the spell effect that he was intending. So this effects artist does an awesome job. But what the, the block end does is it helps to uh, let them know when the, the effect should be visible and when it should uh, disappear. The effects artist makes sure that it, the effect isn't too overwhelming or upstages the character's movements. And speaking of characters, when you get home and you redeem your, your item code, this is the, the little guy you're going to be receiving in your well mailbox. Everybody watching at home also gets that pet as well. All right, it looks like we've got about uh, six minutes or so, we, so we could probably take a few questions from the audience. Uh, if you're brave enough, unlike me, jump on up here. We've got uh, the microphone right there in the middle. And let's hear them. Hello. Hello. As soon as it turns on. Hello. She looks, Hello? there it is. Oh, there we go. Um, so my question is, uh, as an engineer, I really loved uh, the new mounts that came out for us. Um, since this expansion seems to be really engineering driven, can we look forward to any new crafting mounts? Um, particularly anything that you might have had real fun designing uh, from an artist standpoint. Are um, you in the Iron Horde? No. But we can steal their stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we will. There's nothing that we kind of have to show or talk about right now, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, that's a really awesome kit. And hopefully we can use more of it for sure. OK. Um, one more quick thing. Uh, when you do uh, culture sets, uh, how much of the uh, placeholder stuff, not placeholder, but uh, filler stuff, how much of that actually has to have story? Because I know, like, uh, in the Blood Elf starting zone, there's like golden statues of people, and then there's lots of wiki pages with, well, this is what it's what it's about. But uh, so, how much of that do you have to actually fill out for story? There. What was the, was the question for poker sets? I didn't hear the. So uh, you might want to restate that again a little bit. Get in there, but you were talking about the Blood Elves and the and the prop kit for them. Uh, I yeah. Get the question. That was oh. just like one of the questions we did have, which was, so the answer is, a lot of times yes. And for every one of those cultures, like the Blood Elves, there's, we actually have a historian, a team of them, actually, that we have to go to because there's so much information on them that was written before. So, yeah, and a lot of times they put in little Easter eggs in there, and, and, uh, and definitely some of the older areas you'll, you'll see stories tied to them. Sometimes we write the stories and tuck them in there, actually. Thank you. Hi, guys. 
Uh, when you create a male night elf these days and opt to give him a clean shape, he'll lose the eyebrows. Is there a way with the new character model we can keep our clean shave and keep our eyebrows? I believe we, we possess the technology. That, that, <laughs> that actually doesn't sound like a, like a you know, conscious decision that we made, maybe, but uh, I'll keep that in mind. That's a good point. I'll look into it. Thanks. Hi there. Uh, I got two questions. Uh, first one is, with the characters being remodeled, is it going to be, other than the Pandaria and all the other ones, or is it only like the original eights? Yeah, so um, we, we kind of cut off right at um, the goblins and the, uh, and um, I'm Morgan. blanking right, Morgan, Morgan. yeah. So we, so we did those guys, we felt like that was kind of taking us up to, the, uh, to where we wanted to be. And then when we started working on the Pandaren, we just we kind of hit this new stride of like there's all this cool stuff we were doing with the animation and the kung fu really I think went a long ways into kind of describing their movement and made us realize we wanted to take it even farther. So we kind of take a look at that at that range and I think where we're at right now is we're planning to do everything up to those guys. So you know we'll be including like the Blood Elves and the Draenei. And then once we get all that done, we're take we're going to take a look at it as a kit and make the decision whether or not we feel like we need to address the Worgen and the Goblin. Okay, cool. And uh, the second question is, with the garrisons, they look very typically alliance or horde based. Are they gonna, since they're specific for the player, are they good, are they gonna be just alliance and horde based, or are they gonna be like racially looking? Well. Uh, we do have some props that uh, have specific race uh, variants to them. The answer I've heard on that is everybody would Maybe. like that. So it's, it's, I think it's a, we'll it's see. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. Wait, did you say now. racist garrisons or racial? <laughs> you hear what you want to hear. He does. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Can you show us or tell us a little bit about the redesign for the female troll, please? Oh, I wish I could. Yeah, we literally, like, I think we just saw the latest rev of that um, on Wednesday. So, unfortunately, I don't have it here. But what I wanted to do, you know, man, I really wanted to come with, like, the whole thing, right? And just kind of build it up and get everybody excited about everyone. But um, we don't have them right now. Like, we're kind of right in the middle of it. So, we wanted to come and show you as much as possible. And at this point, we're planning on probably doing some, some website releases or other things just to kind of, as we go along, show you guys our progress and kind of keep you updated on what we're doing with all of that. So I would just look, you know, come to our website and just keep checking back and we'll, we'll put some messaging out there. We'll get chat on it, um, put some messaging out there about when, when we're going to be done on that stuff. So it's all you now, man. It's all on you. I'll no see pressure. what I can do. Thank you. My question regards... Um, some models, when they have hair or ears, they'll poke through and it makes it look really tacky and gross. With the new bones and hair and that sort of thing, is there going to be less of that or none of that at all? So like when you're wearing a helmet, they'll poke through awkwardly? Is that kind of what or you're talking about? Or in the case of my Draenei Paladin, through the shield. Through the shoulder? Through the shield. Oh, the shield? Like when it's in back. Yeah, a certain amount of that is kind of inevitable. Like, um, you know, we try to cut it off where we can, and we have to make that choice. Is it egregious enough that we're going to take the ears off? And can you notice if we take the ears off? There are a lot of, you know, armor sets and helmets where if we cut them off, you can tell. So we opt to leave them on just for the, for the believability. But, um, I, you know, I think we can probably move a little bit more of that stuff with the animation, but I don't think it's going to really give us what we need to make sure that that case never happens. Okay. Thank yeah, you. We did find uh, some of it, like, while well, touching up the animations, there were a lot of clipping with, like, the ears and the hair. We've, we've adjusted that and just addressed some of those little, those little clipping issues. All right, you guys, that's going to have to be it for us. Thank you for coming out. Thank you guys so much. On behalf of Chris, Steve, Gary, Wendy, Eric, all the teams they represent, as well as myself, thank you for coming to the Art of World of Warcraft panel. Enjoy the rest of BlizzCon. Thank you for attending the Art of World of Warcraft panel. Up next, Diablo 3 Lore and Story Q&A.